this video I'm going to demonstrate 3D interactive scatter plots in Loon, some of the features of which you'll see the demonstration are described in the slide here. I'm going to look at two different data sets. One will be a large protein molecule and the other will be the deep earthquakes data given in the uh, quakes data set in R. So for the first demonstration, this is the data we're going to be looking at and this is the script that I'm going to try to follow. So let's try to go and do that demonstration. So the data that we have for the molecule is recorded here in this data set IgG1. So it's got lots of information, particularly the re record type, the uh, name of the atom, name of the residue attached to that atom. But we're only looking at the 1500 plus carbon atoms that are in the uh, sequence and just name the residues that are attached to them. Particular interest here, of course, are going to be these X, Y, and Z coordinates, which are the, the uh, coordinates of each carbon atom in the molecule. So what we want to see is a 3D figure of this molecule and something that we can uh, rotate around. To that end, we're going to use L underscore plot 3D, which is like an L underscore plot, except that it's got an additional uh, variable giving the Z dimension, the third dimension of the data. <clears throat> the rest of this call is going to be something that you can look at to see what happens. It's just there to make our life a little easier right now. None of those arguments are necessary. So when we pull this up, we get the inspector, the loon inspector, appearing here at the top left and the molecule itself. And you can see immediately that it's uh, a T-shaped molecule, which is not unusual for uh, antibodies, and that there's a they're sort of hinged in the middle of these three globs. And notice the two different colors. Those two different colors came from the record type. Uh, so there are two different types of uh, atoms in here, of carbon atoms that are identified. All the black ones are the ones with amino acids hanging off it, and all the blue ones have uh, sugar molecules hanging off of them. So that those are the residues. So as you can see, we've got a title, uh, x-axis and a y-axis, and if I click on the R button, that puts us into rotation mode. As you see, it flagged up here, and now I can use the arrow keys, the left-right arrow keys, to uh, rotate about the vertical axis and back again and you notice that the down here the uh, X and Y labels are changing to showing you which linear combination of the three variables are being displayed at any given time. If I go over to the inspector I can just turn off these labels because they're not really that helpful in examining this uh, molecule. So there we go <clears throat> without them. I can also rotate this freehand with the mouse just by um, grabbing it and pushing in the direction that I'd like to rotate it. And you can see the lots of structure here that's in the in the atom itself. And with a little practice, you can get the good at, at actually getting this back to where you started. But if you do get lost, you can always go back to the inspector here and you see the axes here on the bottom. The inspector, click that and that'll put all the molecule back into place. All the atoms are back where they started from. Okay, that said, I'd like to actually just isolate these blue guys and have a look at that. Those are all uh, carbohydrate, part of the carbohydrate chain. So those are the ones with sugar molecules. So I'm going to select all the black ones in the inspector, deactivate them. So now I just have these uh, molecules themselves. And this makes it a little clearer. We've got this axis in the middle, which is a three-dimensional axis. You see three axes there as I grab these points, move them around. That's the center of the rotation. So if I move around, the, the points are all moving around that rotation. Something else you may also notice that the axes are three different colors, uh, red, green, and blue, and you'll notice that they get darker in some situations like that. The axes are pointing into the screen. If I pull around here, they're point, pulling out. Um, finally, you might think that, gee, I'd like to have that the center be in the center of the data. So if I right click on this data set, I'll just move it over to the center. Now that's in the center, at least in terms of this plane but may not be in terms of other planes. I didn't do that bad a job, but I can move that around and adjust it. So now I have that. So scrolling, I'll zoom in here just so we get a better sense of the structure of the data. You can see there's an awful lot of geometric structure in this part of the molecule, just the carbohydrate uh, chain. Um, you might wonder what these uh, structures correspond to. There is in fact more data here beside the three uh, coordinates. So if I go down here and, and look at, for example, the um, residue, which is what, what sort of uh, structure is hanging off of the uh, 
each one of these carbon atoms, I can color all the, the atoms by that, and you'll see that now I've got a lot of structure uh, given by color here. And you see these groups of blue and groups of green and purple and the uh, sort of orangey. And if I go over to the uh, inspector and turn on the item labels, these are this kind of tooltip hover things. You can actually see what corresponds to these blue ones. So that's got uh, sugar galactose hanging off it, residue GAL. That's what all the blue guys are, since we're coloring by the residue. <clears throat> the purple ones are NAG residue, the orange ones, uh, MAN, and the green ones, um, FUCOS, uh, FUC. So you can see a lot of the geometric structure here. So you might wonder, what, how does that appear for the rest of the molecule? Because a lot of nice uh, structure on just this carbohydrate chain and turn off the item labels. Don't need those popping up. And I'll just bring everybody back in. I can do that either in the inspector or just programmatically by saying I want all of the active things to be true. And now I've got a whole host of colors here corresponding to all of the residues. And the residues are, um, so I'm gonna put these back into place and uh, scale it to the plot. So now you can see the structure. And even here with all of these residues, these are all amino acids that are hanging off here back on the item labels just so you can see a couple. So the amino acid hanging off here is glycine uh, off another point. I got glycine again, same color, valine, etc. So you can see the structure of the amino acids hanging off these carbons is, is uh, pretty symmetric. You can see the colors matching on either side. If we move this around, there's a lot of beautiful structure to be investigated. And that would be of, of some, some considerable interest. You can see the, the really clustering of the colors down here where we're looking at the carbohydrates that we zoomed in on a minute ago. Okay, some other structures that might be interested would be uh, interesting to look at uh, would be the chains themselves. I'm gonna put this again back where it was. And to get that, there are different kinds of chains in the uh, carbon atoms. So there are so-called heavy chains. It's the H chain and the I chain. I'm just gonna get this through logicals and color the H chain gray and the I chain light gray. And the same thing I'll go through for the um, so-called light chains. And these are the L and M chains in the data set. And I'll color those blues. And finally, our, carbo our carbohydrate chain, I'll just color all of those guys pink so that they stand out from the rest. To get a sense of it being like a chain, I'm going to increase the point size so that they get closer to uh, sticking together. So if I zoom in out a bit so now you can see that the atoms are touching each other and you get a sense of that there actually are chain like structures going on and they're uh, little chains of beads in this case and you see the the grays going from uh, the one of the top loads down to the bottom and on either case the carbohydrates hanging down this bottom lobe and the top of the t so where these light chains cross over here uh, to get a better sense of that we can actually look at the sequences of the chains in, in a different plot. Um, so let me just, you can look at it, change any of these things to be active. So I'll just turn on the H chain alone. So there's the one chain that we have. And now I'd like to follow it in sequence with a, with a separate prot, plot. So I'm going to just have a plain old L plot here. But it's got the sequence number and the, the uh, chain ID. So it'll produce so all the chains, but we only have one of them active. The H chain is active. So pulling this 2D plot down here, making room for it below the other one. I'm going to just uh, stretch this out a bit and turn on brushing here. These are linked. That's why this is gray. Picked up the gray from that color. So on this 2D plot, I'll turn on brushing here, get a, myself a little brush, make it kind of skinny. And now I'll just brush these chains, this uh, chain in sequence, and you follow that in the, in the uh, 3D plot. So you can see the nice looping back and forwards as the, the chain is followed. Okay, so that's pretty much it. You could do that with any, any of those chains. I could bring them all back in um, and uh, look at them 
So if I reactivated everybody, I now have all the chains available here. And go through the blue chain, etc. And I may find something that I want to identify there and perhaps save as a um, picture to for my publication. I'll just do a, a plot of that. This plot, IgG1, that's just going to give me a nice grid graphics view of the plot, which I can then export or um, look at as a, st as a static plot in any way. Right, so that's it for the molecule. I'm just going to close these guys up and we'll get back to the uh, slides and close these two up. And we'll come back to the quakes in a second. So, so the second demonstration is going to be on the quakes data that's in R. That's about a thousand earthquakes. I just get get the data itself. Make sure we've got the library loon. I'm going to begin with a just a scatter plot with an L plot of just where are the quakes located uh, in latitude and longitude, and that gives us some sense of where they happen to be. It would be better if we actually had some geographic uh, information available. So I'm going to get the uh, nearby islands from the maps package. <clears throat> and select off these nearby islands that I've named here. Don't plot them, we'll just get the data structure. And then in Loon, I can layer that on top of the uh, plot P up here uh, to add a layer of just these islands. And now you can see where we're located. We've got New Zealand here and, and um, Fiji up there. And on the inspector, you can see that there are a lot of islands outside. So if I scroll back here, I'll get a better sense of all of where I am. Lots of little islands around. Uh, where we are geographically on the on the uh, globe. So let's get our 3D plot. So the 3D plot is um, got uh, longitude, latitude, and depth. Now, unlike the uh, molecule, what we have here are three different scales: uh, longitude, and latitude, and degrees of of each. And the depth will be in kilometers, ranging from about 40 to 600 kilometers deep. Uh, the earthquake. So we need to scale them to put them in the same box. I'm going to put them in the same box by their ranges and centered around their average. So executing this, I'll get the 3D plot. And we're, here we have it looks much like the uh, 2D plot, except it's got the axes in the middle. And I'm going to uh, now have a look at uh, the structure here. These are, of course, linked, so you can see that I, by brushing each, I'll see what's happening in the other. So. Let's just turn on rotation mode and introduce the depth. I'm using the down arrow key, and you can see by the uh, X and Y labels, look at the Y label, the vertical label in particular, I want to get uh, pretty much minus one on the depth and zero on the uh, latitude. There we go. And I'm a little bit off screen here, so I'll just move this up. Now what's interesting, uh, is if I look at the 2D plot, and I know I still have latitude and longitude here, and I've got depth and longitude there, so I've got an east-west structure. So you notice if we go over here, what's of interest particularly are, is this region here. So I'm just going to take this group here and, and cut them out for the time being. Uh, just deactivate those and zoom in on this part here and maybe move these guys over there and zoom in a bit. Okay, so now I want to brush on the uh, map. So turn on brushing and get myself a wide mat, wide brush that is only a couple of degrees tall. And you observe as I go from north to south on the map, on the 3D image, I'm kind of getting these diagonal uh, lines appearing. And that's pretty consistent moving from east to west across the 3D map. But it can get these diagonal lines appearing. So the geophysicists offer this as evidence of, that there's a, a shear effect going on as one of these uh, tectonic plates is being sub subjugated under the other. And that appears in those nice diagonal shears so that's one effect that's of particular interest to the geophysicists here, which you can see. The other is to um, focus on the so-called hook. So this hook here is this question mark part, and I'm just reshape the brushes I have, and I'm just going to hold the, the shift key down. I'm going to just pick up this, this hook bit in here, best I can. 
and I'll invert that and cut everybody else away. So I just want to focus on, on this part here. And again, I'll zoom in. And you can see it kind of breaks into three regions, the sort of northerly region, a southerly, a southerly region, and a central region. And if I brush again over here, you'll see that there's a corresponding structure in the, in the um, 3D plot. So what the authors do is we rotate this a little bit this way, and you can start to see some interesting features here. And they divide the uh, geographic region into the northern region, this part, which corresponds to a nice vertical line here. Again, in their words, uh, suggesting a, a, uh, a shear failure. So there's a, a shear going on here. The central part now has got this, again, a vertical piece, but it's also got at the tail end here, this kind of uh, angular piece. So it's got a, sort of an L shape. They interpret this as, as, as indicating that there's shearing and out of plane shearing going on in the central part. And then there's this gap here that between the two. And as we go to the southern region, again, I probably should get a little narrower. You, you get vertical lines appearing again, again, evidence of, of some shearing in the, in the south. So all those features are discovered in the paper, the 1984 paper uh, in Nature and it's easily explored with the um, 3D rotating point cloud in Loon and with all of the other features of, of Loon. So that ends a demonstration. I just wanted to show you the sources here so that you can go get the data yourself in the first case, and you can reproduce the analysis of the quakes uh, strictly from R after installing uh, Loon from CRAN. So that's just install packages Loon. I hope that was of some value and I hope you get the get some good use out of this uh, feature of Loon.